Good afternoon. Um, I am Jeff Huber, as, as Lourdes just mentioned. I was given an introduction to both of these folks that are about to come up here. I don't think I really need it too much, um, but um, I have the distinct honor to introduce both my professional partners and what I consider to be my family. Um, Larry and Angela Brooks, uh, Brooks Scarpa. Um, Brooks Scarpa was founded over 30 years ago um, at this point, and it's been a real honor working with them and starting the office here in, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, um, about seven years ago. Um, the office is headquartered in Los Angeles. Larry and Angie both have a strong tie to Florida. Um, Angie was born and raised in the Tampa area. Larry's from all over um, Florida. Winter Haven, Miami, he always says, I, I'm from Homestead originally, he always says he had to go down to Homicide Homestead to go mow lawns. Um, it's, a, it, it's a real honor to have them here today and speaking on such an incredible topic of uh, high design for low income housing. I do wanna make a mention that uh, I think many of you know Larry and Angie are the uh, gold medal laureates this year from the National AIA and so I wanna just go ahead and congratulate. But now I'm going to give you some back room in information on uh, uh, a little thing. Everybody, uh, you know, last year I had the great honor of being elected into the, the National St Strategic Council. And in there I got to be in the room where the presentations happened. Uh, Bill Hercules, as well as Joyce Owens, can attest to this. Um, unfortunately, they kicked me out during the executive session when Larry and Angie were one of the finalists being uh, reviewed and, and discussed on this. And, when I came back in, I will not say who told me um, that they were actually awarded. <laughs> they will go nameless, <clears throat> but she's somewhere around here and then <laughs> also getting her award later on tonight. But with that, Peter Exley took away my cell phone immediately upon understanding I knew who it was that uh, won. And so I had to sit there with Peter holding my cell phone while he called Larry and Angie to congratulate them on the award. But um, I could not imagine, um, you know, again, working with two uh, great individuals and having them to speak on such a, an important topic. I think this year's um, theme of empower and elevate, elevate and empower, I think it is. I think I keep flipping. Uh -huh is an incredible topic and the session we just heard uh, from Pascal was just amazing and I think um, really what we're looking at is architects having to serve the public interest, having to be citizen architects, having to elevate our profession and really to push where we can bring value to the everyday. And so without further ado, Larry has told me to start this presentation and so I will click it to the next one and uh, with that we'll Welcome, Larry and Angie. You may want to hold back your applause because they want you to listen to this video. All right. Is it is nearly 100% independent from the power grid. It was built by an architect who specializes in... A new building that is energy conscious is now going up in Santa Monica, and it's getting a lot of attention. Channel 4's Patrick Healy is there. Is At first, it appears to be any new apartment project, just another building noisily being put up on a Santa Monica corner lot. But Colorado Court is in the... One of Leo's personal uh, passions is finding out ways to provide environmentally safe housing to low-income families. Take a look. We're standing here at the first green affordable housing project in the country. This is Larry Scarpa, the architect. You get the idea. <laughs> that was 2002. It was crazy. Um, we were just doing what we thought was the right thing. That was the first LEED certified building in this country. And we had no idea what we were doing. We were just doing what we thought was right. Uh, my mother would refer to it as Jewish common sense. Um, but we, you know, we just looked out there and we said, you know, who needs this the most? Who needs? It's people who live in affordable housing. They pay the most money of their uh, percentage of their income goes to utility bills. You know, it just makes sense. They should have this. We just didn't realize the hurdles that were before us when, when we did that. It's a fairly simple building. Uh, it wears its 
solar panels on its sleeve, but it's shaped like an alphabet building. Uh, it's like an old hotel that induces airflow through it. Uh, it's passively very, very efficient. And then it has the solar panels on it. And, you know, again, common sense things. The balconies are um, shaded. The panels shade uh, the building as well. Um, but certain things, um, you know, like you look at this, and maybe even some of you are thinking it, the solar panels are vertical. Well, that's not very efficient. Um, that, in fact, is not true when you take into the reality of the dirt that accumulates on them, vertical performs just about as equal as horizontal when they're not cleaned. Um, the other thing too I would say is like we don't make machines, we make buildings for people. And I would argue that a building that's an energy hog that everyone loves is more sustainable than a zero energy building that nobody likes. Um, Although this one was designed to be energy neutral. Right. And, um, you know, the units are small. Um, again, simple things, you know, cross ventilation, natural light. Anyone out there hate natural light? You know, hate cross ventilation? I mean, that's all you got to do and you, it's a win, you know? So it doesn't take a lot. It takes, you know, what we would say is common sense. Uh, we did some experimental things, um, you know, with stormwater, which we're, you know, deep into here now with water issues in Florida. Uh, this is a micro turbine that you see that it's like a refrigerator size thing that produces energy. Um, and we had a whole array of systems, uh, some that worked, some that didn't, uh, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. And a lot of the things that we did on this project, it took basically an act of Congress to get done today our standard. It's normal practice. Um, we got, for this project, pretty much every award on the planet for it. But when we finished it, we had a kind of sense of emptiness uh, about it, you know, and we, we questioned because we said, you know, is this building any better than that one you see there on the left? So we tried very, very hard to not only make a good building for the people, but good for the community. And we ran into hurdles. Like if you look at the ground floor of that building, it has, you know, it, you're talking prime, most expensive real estate in the country, downtown Santa Monica. We could not get them to do retail down there. We got a community room and parking. And we were like, oh my God, I can't believe we can't do it. And when we started to understand the nonprofit bylaws, the funding and all of that, we said, this just isn't right. Um, so what did we do? We summoned a bunch of our friends. Uh, some of these might look like familiar faces, Julie Eisenberg, Hank Koning, uh, uh, you see some people from uh, more Rubel Udell. We started meeting at our office uh, the, ev the first Saturday of every month to talk about things we could do to change that. You know, how could we make better, more sustainable, livable communities? And so we did all kinds of crazy things. Uh, these are some of the studies of our groups, uh, densifying the single family lots. Uh, to getting grants to hold competitions from the NEA. And after about a year and a half, we decided we should try to do something. And uh, we, we wrote some grants. Uh, and we were trying to address the issue of housing, you know, people, um, what we called the working poor, you know, school teachers, uh, firefighters, hotel workers, restaurant workers, who in LA would sometimes commute two hours or more to their job. And so the families were broken apart just by travel distance and how do we put those people closer to home. So we wrote the, these grants about 
you know, the ideas of doing that. And to our surprise, like overnight, we got millions of dollars in grants and we became this nonprofit called Livable Places. We really wanted to research ideas that existed beyond the property line. So we actually did research on what other cities and states were doing. And we discovered that at the time, the director of Portland said that everyone who lived there hated both sprawl and density. <laughs> and he didn't know what to do about it. And we said, we know what to do about it. <laughs> and there were other places like the state of Massachusetts who were doing some really progressive things. They had, uh, literally, it's on the books. They have an anti-snob initiative, all right? Right, which is that if at any time the percentage of affordable housing falls below, I believe it was 10%, the anti-snob initiative kicked in, and then any nonprofit developer could build affordable housing anywhere and not have to follow any design guidelines or policies. So everyone wanted to make sure it was built because they didn't want it next to them, you know? Uh, but this is our, our, when we started Livable Places, our intent was to do projects, that building we bought right there, uh, and show what could be done by example, uh, but also deal with things on a policy level because we felt like our experience with Colorado Court, we wanted to make those things like not being able to do retail on the ground go away for others too, not just for us. And so we thought we could show how to do it and our, um, our developer fees for doing development would support our policy. Well, in reality, it worked just the opposite way. We got so much traction on the policy end, that was really leading the charge. So we bought this building. Um, it was a fuller paint warehouse. We paid about $3 million for it. And we Livable almost, Place is the nonprofit bought the building. Yeah. <laughs> we, we almost went broke doing this. And we uh, had something called a recession, I think. At yeah. that time. <laughs> there were other things too. You know, we were trying to do it differently, but we routinely had offers, you know, that were $5 million plus profit uh, before we did anything. Uh, but we persevered. Uh, we, we uh, you know, the idea was to have mixed income, um, affordable units with market rate on top, live work on the ground, near transit, and, um, you know, we built it. And our vision was to go into neighborhoods like this, Lincoln Heights, which was really depressed neighborhood, but right next to downtown, great place and help our buildings would be a catalyst to help redevelop the neighborhood. That's the gold line that's running right in front of this project. And the whole entire uh, Lincoln Heights neighborhood was zoned industrial, where it was illegal to build housing at the time. It took 27 variances to get this thing done. One year, it only took us one year to get the 25, but it was meant to be an example of how to show the city how policy needs to change. And it was really the council member Ed Reyes at the time, who was really our advocate and our partner in that. So, you know, when we got this thing built, we had access to capital. We just didn't have it. So, you know, we wanted to build more in the neighborhood, but once we built it, all the developers came in behind us, bought up all the land. So we were out of our own game. Um, you know, but it was a double-edged sword because it was working. The neighborhood was changing. and. And that was the second time that happened. The first project was yeah. done by someone else. So, and we talked, you know, affordability is a big thing, and we were trying to figure that out. You know, we thought, you know, how can, you know, do people who live in affordable housing, why shouldn't they be able to sell their property and make a profit like everyone else? Why does it need to be deed restricted? You know, all these things. And ultimately, um, what happened is, um, the prices of this, where they started out as affordable, are now unaffordable. But what's happening is like, this is right across the street, Patrick Ty's uh, building this affordable project. It's like 150 units. And now the city of LA just approved this project. This is the old jail. It's like a $200 million revitalization. Um, and here's what that's gonna look like. Um, so the neighborhood is like transforming, but as a consequence, you know, I just pulled this up um, 
from online. This is a few years ago, you know, the units in our place are going now for close to a million dollars. Um, so, and they were all condos, no rentals, and that yeah. was part of the issue. So did we succeed? We don't know, you know. Did we try? Yes, you know. So nothing ventured, nothing gained, you know. But on the policy end, we, I don't think, envision the success we would have, you know, with policy. So we started to really uh, get involved in the policy, and we would tell the city of LA how their policies did not work to promote housing. Is anyone here from Los Angeles? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. So I think part of the reason was because at the time the Los Angeles planning wasn't actually doing real planning. And they saw us as the entity that could help them do that. Right. So they had this ordinance that they were very proud of promoting density along transit corridors. And we went in and said, that's a great you know, ordinance, but you know what? So far, zero housing's been built. And they said, that's absolutely wrong. On the blue line, which had already yeah. been built. And they said, your data's incorrect. And we're like, well, we got it from your department, you know? <laughs> and they're like, really? So, you know, now they wanted to know from us why they, they, we thought it didn't work. And they started talking to us and asking us to look at, you know, amendments to their zoning code before they put them out. So we said, you know what, why don't we just write them and propose it to them? So we did that. And this one that was adopted, if you ask any architect in LA, it's, they refer to it as the small lot ordinance. And every architect uses this. It basically brought back the mom and pop developer back to LA. And it's a by right densification. It's almost what we were doing with our studies. And just to give you an idea of, you know, how this group formed, if you go back to our little logo, the Livable Places logo is a, the red dot's a tree, and the circle is a person blindfolded uh, being told to find the tree. And you basically, which for blindfolded, you go around in circles and you eventually like find the tree. And we sort of felt a little bit like we were like that, <laughs> trying to figure out, you know, how to do it in the best way. So it became very popular, you know, and we, the press was like, what's this small lot ordinance thing? In the meantime, there were these great projects being built, not by us, by others. Here's just some of them, you know, that were being built under this ordinance. This one was just finished recently. Uh, Lorcan did this, uh, Mark Rios, Barbara Bester, all our friends are using it. But none of them, though, we wrote that, you know. Um, even they have now a website for it. You, the Small Lot Ordinance has its own website and they track what's going on. And remarkably, HUD follows it, you know, and they say this is like a great example for development. It basically gets rid of the side yards. It allows you to build fee simple with a shared wall, party yeah. wall. So, but like everything, you know, we assume policy, once you do it, it's done, it's over, it's forever. It's maybe more temporary than a building, you know? So everyone's saying, oh, we need to change it. We need to do this. We use it too, because, you know, that was the whole purpose. We make the rules so we can take advantage of them. And then we go into the building department and, you know, we talk to them about a building in the, with the small lot ordinance. And they say, you can't do that. That's not the intent of the code. And we're like, really? Well, we wrote the code, you know, and so that's what tends to happen. So it continues to go, but it's kind of getting watered down. Um, but we're always doing stuff, you know, we call it a, our parallel universe. We have a traditional practice, but we're involved in, you know, a lot of night job stuff. But what we learned is that the perception of the small lot ordinance was one of uh, neighborhoods of single family homes and then someone coming in when they didn't know a developer was gonna come in and put five townhouses on one lot. And they didn't understand the perceived size of that project next to a single family house. And so the intent, which was to make it more affordable, put five homes on a parcel instead of one, isn't what people are um, reacting against. It's really the perceived density and form of the building. Yeah, so we keep moving. We started another uh, nonprofit. Um, this is called the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute, and we just finished, um, you know, 
dislodging ourselves from livable places. And I was having dinner in DC with the director of the NEA, and I was telling him about this idea of doing an institute with affordable housing the way they do the mayor's institute. And he said, like, write a grant, you know? And I'm like, got another night job, you know? So you're gonna hear from Katie tomorrow, Swenson. So I call Katie up and I say, hey, I got this idea, you know? Um, what do you think? She says, you know, my bosses have been talking about this. Let me talk to them. And so we basically did this. We got a grant. And the whole idea, we, we became the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute. And we did this, Katie was a 2010, the first one, 12 years ago. And the idea was to bring a f nonprofits with architects together landscape architects, bankers, and to address the problems and make affordable housing much better buildings. So we thought it was going to be a one-time institute, now on our 12th year. I'm like really no longer involved with it, even Katie's no longer there, and it continues on. So this is the kind of magic when other people can do your work and it keeps going. And Katie and her group at Enterprise took it way beyond what I ever envisioned. Um, so it's become a great thing, and the issue is, is like, and this is Katie's slide, she probably recognizes it, I love this one. Um, you know, the architects think, you know, this is what it looks like, the, how you do housing. There's the developer and the architect, and you know, you just keep going. Well, it really looks like this. It's very, very complicated. And 70% of those decisions are made before the architect even gets involved. So our whole idea was to kind of make design matter. And Katie and her group, uh, you know, we put together a whole resource of uh, documents and documented the proceedings and made available free to the public you know, all these tools um, to architects that you can just download um, online, you know. And these are just samples and printouts from some of the things, pre-development toolkit. Um, and basically, in the end, what we were trying to show is that uh, affordable housing projects can make for better communities. It's a proven fact that when you have mixed communities, not just mixed people, but mixed incomes, they thrive more. And that was kind of our mission to do that and show that design matters. And this is David Baker who proves that um, it doesn't look different either. <laughs> None of us at the end of a hard day at work say, I think I'm gonna go to my housing unit after work. No one says that. People say, I'm going home. And hopefully the residents who have the opportunity to be in a home of their own, uh, leaving a life of homelessness behind, uh, hopefully they feel those same sorts of, of connections to what uh, a home represents. People are always a little worried um, about an affordable housing building going in or a, a supportive housing building going in. And I think all too often homeless folks who have passed through various systems probably reflect the worst in design. Um, this is the local welfare office, this is the local mental health office, this is the local probation office. Um, at best, pretty utilitarian, at worst, uh, spaces that communicate a very negative uh, message to the people who engage in those spaces. And we think that's a, a, a model that should be changed. Design can be used creatively uh, as a solution to ending homelessness, 
no matter where it exists. So this is a rectangular shaped building on a rectangular shaped lot. Nothing terribly unusual about it. Pretty commonplace actually when you think about it. But I think it, it says you can do something really imaginative and creative in, in terms of crafting that solution even on a plain old apartment building lot. Angie mentioned that the facade of this building is actually a space, which is the first time I heard her describe it that way, and I thought, that is really pretty interesting. The facade is actually a space. This is a great looking building on this block, even without homeless folks in it. Uh, the fact that homeless people live here, I think, once again, promotes a very uh, positive depiction of what supportive housing can and should look like, in my opinion. I used to sneak in McDonald's and stuff, like I used to restroom and go in there and take a bath. My pride was really bad to just go and say I'm homeless. This building is marvelous. So I have family come visit. We have a community room. Like you won't guess, your guests don't have to be inside your home. They can be inside the guest room, enjoy your company for a couple of hours and send them on their merry way. We created an aperture which was lifted up above the street so that it appears really open. There's a visual connection to the street, but not necessarily a physical connection. You can come up on the roof and just relax your brains and get your thoughts out and make yourself better. This building right here will make you a better person. This we is, this we is, train our tenants to be architectural I gonna, critics. I was going to say, we, this is why we need post-occupancy studies, <laughs> so we can go back and interview the people who live in our buildings to actually find out if they're actually working for them. <laughs> um, and on the, this is called the six. In military terms, it means I've got your back. And it is for homeless veterans. Um, and you'll notice that I have density. Some of these images showed the density on the slide because I really think that our profession needs to start talking about densities above 50 homes per acre. Nothing lower than that. Um, it's designed as a courtyard building. A lot of our buildings are like that, but essentially this one needs to lift the courtyard up off the ground floor. Um, everything we do in California has to be highly sustainable, lead platinum and everything. So when you look at courtyard buildings and um, the other things that you need to do for passive design, it, always, it really works with the climate crisis we have and the goals that we need to meet on that side as well. Um, the courtyard is visually connected to the street, yet physically separate. We actually met with a building committee made up of homeless people, uh, and our first designs had more of a uh, stair that connected people to the street with a porch because I, we thought that's what people wanted and they said we've been living on the streets for so long the streets are very dangerous and we don't want to be even close to the street so the courtyard was made and this building was made very very secure but you know design matters how do you make a building that's designed well that is very secure but looks completely open and makes people who live there feel like it's open um, you have to be connected to green space. This is the courtyard on the second floor. We also have planting on the roof, which is more of like a zen sort of area for people to go. Um, but those are all, all really come together to make these um, you know, buildings. And these little triangular things are actually the vents for the ovens that have to come up through the roof. Um, but courtyards, are everywhere throughout history, right? These are, you know, they're around the world and they are used for passive reasons but also for social reasons. It's a typology that's been around for thousands of years and like when we get the talk, we start to figure out a little bit what we're doing and what we're finding is pretty much all of our buildings are courtyard buildings in some form or another. And even in Florida, people will say, well, Angie, in Florida, you know, we need air conditioning and we need to close our windows and doors, so why do we need courtyards? You know, well, we need courtyards everywhere because they are this threshold of space. Um, these are just some examples. Irving Gill was there. Um, so this is a project in downtown Santa Monica that actually is passively designed, has a density of over 260 homes per acre, which is about the same as Manhattan, uh, for uh, people who are previously homeless with mental disabilities, and it's the letter E. So if you remember back 100 years ago, we used to design buildings that were called alphabet buildings. It's because they were letters. They had very narrow floor plates. Um, but we did a couple things. 
which is the tall screen on the side, which shades the two courtyards, and then the front of the building, which is water jet cut aluminum uh, panels. And on projects that we work on at this level, uh, they have tight budgets and tight schedules, and so we really are strategic in where we want to put a little bit of money. And uh, we call it mass customization, but these panels were all water jet cut once, and then anodized different colors and put up in sort of a different pattern. <clears throat> we stacked them up to get a 10 for one price. Um, and the units are very small, so they're about 245 square feet each. And ironically, um, my client said, Angie, put as many people on this property as you can. And that is what I did, and the plan is sort of designed like a little piece of jewelry, essentially. Every wall is a sheer wall, you know. When Larry took a look at it, he said, why are you putting so many people on this site? And it's a type five building on a site that's about 50 by 150, so a typical suburban lot. Um, and there are Murphy beds that flip out of the wall, small kitchenettes, people don't have ranges, but they share their kitchens. And I think this is another thing that our country really doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about, these shared spaces. Um, there are countries that actually have buildings that are called kitchenless, you know, kitchenless homes. People live in homes without kitchens and they share the kitchen space on the ground floor. It's how we used to live in the 1930s. What about sleeping on the floor? Um, after coming back to this building, after people moved in, uh, I met one of the tenants who was also a part of the building committee of this group, and he told me that um, when he got the key to his front door, he could not sleep on his bed for an entire year and had to sleep on the floor because he felt so um, ignored over the last 20 years. He had been living on the street, and he felt like it would be taken away in a second. And so he actually slept on the floor for an entire year before he, before he could literally sleep in his bed. Um, this is just an image of two of the kitchens that are shared. Um, we it's this one. It's this one. That's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that's how we should start thinking about housing, not just affordable housing, but market rate housing. You know, for young people, we need to share a lot of our private spaces as well, of our, as, well as our public spaces. And we look at things like exit stairs, typical things you need to have in projects, and we think about design and how people circulate. You know, this is a required exit stair that's open in the middle of this courtyard that then goes down into a tunnel, and the tunnel drops you out on the sidewalk. And it took several hours talking to the building official about it and getting them to approve it, but um, it really makes this project what it is today. Back 2011, I messed around and, and somehow in front of my grandmother's house, I got shot for no reason. Never, she lives in Compton though. I was at my grandmother's house, boom, got shot. I got on SSI. I got shot right here. I got shot right here. Right here. And it came out, it brought me to the hospital, they took it out. I had to see where like my mental health was and my body, you know, because um, it was bad, you know. I could not put my thought together for um, work. It just, it hurt, it hurt so bad. So I got on SSI and um, 2013 or 14, something like that, I, I ended up joining with Step Up. They help you fix your mind, you know, you gotta do it every day. 48 hours, you gotta do two days of thought processing. And uh, they help out with the uh, mental help of that disorder. I'm not gonna lie, this building is like the future, or the futurism, because I mean, every time you look around, you're like, wow, is that uh, decorative? You know, is that a, a, uh, um, advisive? You know what I mean? It's just very, very nice, too, and I love the, uh, the, 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 the uh, skyscape or something like that. We're still working on him as an architectural critic. <laughs> He's getting there. <laughs> um, uh, the developer Skid Row Housing Trust, the six that we showed you, Mike Alvedris, uh, shared office space with me about 30 years ago, so I've known him for a very long time, and he was the executive director for 30 years. And when he gave us these two small buildings on Skid Row, he, they were their existing buildings, and he said, Angie, we'd love to have you work with us, but we're sorry these buildings already exist. We just need you to add a stair to one and add an elevator to another no one. No design. There's no design involved whatsoever. And we were like, okay, we don't care. We're going to do them for you. <laughs> Angie worked for a nonprofit group out of school to start her career. 
And so Mike and her, in their very younger days, sat next to each other uh, when Skid Row started. Mm -hmm. It was called the Los Angeles Community Design Center, and I felt, when I graduated from SciArc with a design degree, I really felt that I wanted to make communities better, uh, think about these bigger issues, but the profession really wasn't situated. She was accused me, of doing so. a Berkeley thesis at SciArc. <laughs> But this is what we got in the building. This was their fire court, you know, the way out of there. These two spaces, you see the little square, about 16 foot square, and then one eight by 60. It looked like that when we got it. Um, sorry. Looks like that now. Um, and this is literally the fire department access because someone sold the rest of the property off to another a property owner. So uh, we cleaned up this courtyard. It's the, literally the only exterior public space that this building, which has 60 people living there, the rooms are small with just refrigerators and sinks, and everyone cooks on the ground floor, common kitchen. Um, but we really spent a lot of time designing these uh, benches that would move back and forth, and this wood kind of um, screen on the side to cover actually what are people's bedroom windows as they look into the courtyard. It gives people dignity, and that's what I think everyone wants. Didn't cost a lot of money, you know, when you look at the whole scheme of things. This is an eight-foot side yard that people literally threw trash into constantly. So the, uh, our client actually hung a screen, a mesh screen, so that when people threw garbage out of their window, the garbage would collect, and then they, you know, and it caused shadow on this courtyard. But it's because it was an under utilized trashy side yards. People said, it's a trashy side yard, I'm gonna throw my trash there. <clears throat> but if you do something with it. It looks like this now. And they all get their pots and they take care of them. It's successful to some degree. You know, they have a little competition who has the best plant and, you know. And people use it to socialize and sit out there and think and no one throws trash in it any longer. And you know, you're not allowed to smoke in these buildings anywhere, but we still made these low planters that have ashtrays in them built in because, you know, for some, it's medically proven that nicotine helps a lot of people who suffer from mental disabilities. Um, and then this project, which just recently finished in Venice, is for a different tenant population. Um, they are called Tay. Kid, they call them kids, but they're between the ages of 18 and 22, and it means transi transitional aged youth, and they form a, a big percentage of the homeless population because they are have come out of the foster care system without a family support, maybe that most of you in this room have, so they become homeless. Yeah, they turn 18 and they can't stay in the youth facilities anymore. Or their families don't get paid. And they wind up on the street. So this is a project for those kids who would otherwise be living on the street. Who have been living on the street in Venice for a long time, and so there are organizations that actually help them, but they didn't have housing. Um, but, but like you can see, this one's also a courtyard building. The small one, tiny little one, a courtyard building, they keep sort of resurfacing as these kind of courtyard typologies. And there's Irving Gill, so it doesn't, you know, Irving Gill's project built in 1919 was a 60 foot wide lot four homes with garages in the back, with two apartments on top of the garages, which would be completely illegal to build today in Santa Monica. And we, when we moved to California 30 plus years ago, we moved to Venice, and what I tell people is that when we moved there, there were helicopters every day because of gang wars, and we still have those helicopters today, except they're following Lindsay Lohan to court. So the, the neighborhood has changed, and you could build affordable housing back then and no one would blink an eye. Now you mention the word and everyone comes out of the woodwork. Um, so this project took an act of Congress to get approved. It's right across from Whole Foods. Well, 50 public meetings, the local Venice Neighborhood Council unanimously rejected it. And there have been 300 percent affordable housing projects in Venice that have been unanimously rejected by the Venice Neighborhood Council, and then the Planning Commission of the City of LA unanimously has approved them. All three, all in the Coastal Commission District, you know, all without parking or with very little bit of parking, and it's because the folks who've been appointed to the Planning Commission by the mayor are advocates of affordable housing, and they realize that these kinds of projects should be built. And it's got terraces in the sky, you know, lots of green. 
We did the scallop facade and stucco and has sparkle green in it. I don't know if you've been to Hollywood and seen the sidewalks glittering. This building actually glitters when you go by. Even when the fire trucks or police go by it, it like glitters red, you know. So a lot of people, they're puzzled by it. They stop in front of it. You know, what is that going on there? But most of these buildings have ordinary materials. And what we try to do with ordinary materials is look at them and kind of cull out what we can that's beautiful from them. The original bid that we got from the builder for this was about $150,000 to add the sparkle to the building because they didn't know what it was, had never done it, didn't understand how to apply it, nothing. So we kept trying to get them to lower the price. So I finally went in our shop and I videoed myself actually making the sample. And then I gave them the video and their price went from 150,000 to 12,500. We bought the tool, we actually did it. We said the, somebody follows the plaster with the tool, sprays the glitter on. Didn't cost anything. It's a project that cost twelve and a half million dollars, and yeah, we give them this. For the you know, glitter. that's a little extension of the walkway up top there that sticks out on the front. It's got like two hundred and seventy degree views from ocean to mountains. You know, why can't poor people have that too? You know, it just gives them dignity. And so the design can be these small pieces of a part of a bigger project and really impact everyone's live life who lives here. Um, the courtyard is actually two levels, so it goes from the third level to the second level. Spent hours talking to the building department about accessibility and who could actually step on the stairs going down. Um, but it's a beloved building now, and um, it's a 50-50 adult homeless and Tay kids and 35 units, and they think that's a perfect <coughs> mix. And Venice Community Housing, which had their headquarters on this parcel, had started talking to me many years back about doing this project and they said we don't have a site for this project and I said well you you own your own land where you are now why don't you just redevelop where you're sitting now because you're in a one-story building with a little two-story apartment next to you you're not you know and she, Becky said that's a great idea and so they actually we planned it they moved out they moved back in and I had forgotten that I had mentioned that to her and then when we had the opening the mayor was there the city council member and she she said Angie we want you to say a few words and as an architect I've never been asked to say a few words at a building opening ever and I said sure and she introduced me and she said Angie's the reason why this project exists because when she came to my office she said why don't you just develop the parcel you have right now it's right here you can densify it you can actually grab another 13 feet of your parcel area which is another ordinance in the city of LA no one knows about and she did it so I thought wow that was great that was my idea I'm gonna do that more often <laughs> I'm gonna skip that one. yeah this is a model this is a also recently completed this is inclusionary housing so it's market rate and affordable a percentage of affordable we think this is the model for the future because they don't have the same problems of passage with the NIMBYs and other people that come out against the project because they include market rate. And they, this is in a very up and coming trendy area of North Hollywood called NoHo, where they need people to work in restaurants and you know service industries and stuff. So it has uh, 10, 15% affordable units in this project and you don't even know they exist. And we encounter this all the time. You know, we go to public meetings and we hear people stand up. You know, those people, like they're, they're not humans. And we say, well, those people are out here, you know, in the audience, pick them out and we won't build your project. Well, of course they can't tell them and they wouldn't dare do that. They might pick a friend who would be offended, you know. But if you look at the lower right photograph, that's what we're dealing with. These are the streets in Los Angeles are very, very wide, one-story buildings, you know, so. Courtyard building, again, a simple idea. This one has a bridge that goes across it. You see some of the same ideas. And uh, Joe Giovannini, I didn't think about this, but he said this is like a buildings within a building, you know? It's kind of a, reflects the neighborhood in a way, 60 units, and it's got the big courtyard. And the courtyard really is this threshold of space that protects you from the busy street. And someone uh, asked me, you know, Angie, these are 
a lot of market rate units and they said, why are you putting the market rate units you know, against the alley in the back? Why didn't you put them in the front facing the street? You know, and the reason is because they're much better in the back and they face a courtyard with greenery and then they can kind of see the street and everyone who is on that back side actually shares in this common sort of forecourt, which is a courtyard. You get light and shade. Um, you know, you kind of get everything. We kind of discovering as we do the hole in the roof actually is a good thing because it gives you shade and light. Um, and we're closer to home here. We're working, we have three projects um, underway and um, uh, Mike O'Hara, our client, is here and Ronnie's also doing one in the same neighborhood, Normandy Isles. It's a historic neighborhood and we have three senior projects going on. It's a total of about 150 units um, that we, you know, managed to get through past in a historic neighborhood, you know, with a lot of people who care about design. Ivanka Trump lives on an island just right over. You can almost throw a rock at their house. But again, like a lot of things we do, we looked at, you know, we try to look where we work and find something unique to uh, the area. You know, I pretty much grew up here in South Florida and I've always loved this stuff. My, you know, my grandmother lived in Miami Beach and she lived in the Delano when it was decrepit. It was a senior home, you know, before any of this. And so, you know, we really wanted to do like a colorful building, like pink. And Mike has been a great client and we're doing this kind of Miami Beach inspired building that has a lot of pink in it. Um, this is it, this is what it's looked like. This is, we're in plan, uh, doing plan check corrections right now, so we're probably gonna start construction on this pretty soon. But it incorporates the breeze block, um, you know, the courtyard and a lot of those things too, but also sea level rise, you know, is a big thing. So this is an adaptable building. You know, that's, there's a big challenge because you have to move the floor plane up but you don't want to feel like it's on a giant pedestal. So we kind of work very hard to make the, the ground plane adaptable, but also feel like part of the neighborhood. You don't want it to look like a stilt house. Yeah. Um, but the road is going to be raised about three feet in the future. That's the Eventually. city plan. And then these are two projects uh, a few blocks away, uh, right across from each other. Yep. Um, similar idea uh, with the big courtyards that face each other, raising it up for sea level rise adaptation and like kind of letting that space uh, be for people. So there are two particular sites. This one is called the Breeze and I don't remember which has more units or less. It's Breeze, okay. This one is 74, I charge. believe. Um, but it has some similar concept with the gardens and the cross ventilation. And we like to think about psychology of the place too. And if you can see greenery, you feel closer to it, even if your unit isn't necessarily right on the planter or the courtyard. And most of the projects in housing are infill. You know, they're basically between lots and between other buildings, but occasionally, you get like corner buildings and corner buildings are particularly important because they're the guardians of the block and you they're all over America. You know, there are good ones and there are bad ones, but you have to be very careful when you do a corner building uh, because if you lose a corner building, you lose the whole block. Like this is a building that you can see here in St. Louis, what it used to look like and what happened, they let it go. And now if you look at this next picture, you see the building next to it is now vacant. And the one next to that's gonna fall too. So corner buildings are really important. We'll run out of time here. So this is a corner building nearby the other one. Um, and you know, we basically have treated that building um, making it a much better corner building with the courtyards 
We use perforated screens so that it looks a, a bit ephemeral. You don't really know where the solid stops and you know the screen sort of begins. And this uh, was built on a gas station lot. And we've been real. A lot of gas stations are going away for obvious reasons, and we're building housing instead of gas stations on the corners of our blocks now. Yeah, and, and so this is coming back now because the, the we lost the whole cor the corner, uh, but now the properties are being redeveloped around this. Um, not recently, we uh, the LA has a huge housing problem, um, and the voters have you know, passed a couple billion dollars in bond measures to do something about it. As part of it, they put out this innovation challenge, a grant for ideas to do something about homelessness. And, uh, you know, this was meant for developers, but we entered and we won. We uh, asked the developers to join us. <laughs> yeah. It's called the Nest Toolkit, and it's really just a kit of parts. It's, we're not really designing anything, but we're providing a dual, toolkit for designers. And we're taking the prefab home building industry and tailoring it to permanent supportive housing, temporary, uh, permanent, and even market rate. And it it's, fills that mid-density range, so about five stories of this prefab, which is wood frame prefab is what you can get. And we're working with plant prefab um, as our partner. And these are just potential ideas. Um, it's now offered from plant prefab, you can see here. When it's finally complete, you'll be able to go online, put in your lot information, it'll configure it for you, you can make your choices and it'll spit out a price for you and you can make the purchase. We're waiting for our first demonstration project to actually get complete before we finish the website. And this is it, this is the one that's being built now. And if there's any tip I can give you guys, if you're doing something that maybe people haven't seen before, uh, or the city thinks is maybe too innovative, just call it a demonstration project. Right. Say, it's just a demonstration project you guys never need to do it again. <laughs> right. Don't worry about it. And I guarantee you the second one is going to be much easier. So we now have many, many projects using our own toolkit. This is one in Culver City. Um, this is a housing for homeless uh, college kids. This is a church by Santa Monica College. Uh, they already have kids there. Um, they have a big parking lot. So we're not allowed to build multifamily housing there. So we're making like a 13 bedroom house, uh, which with is- With two kitchens, which is totally kitchens. allowed by code. Right, city hates us for that. Uh, the last thing we're gonna show you here is, you know, we are always working to make affordable housing like better. So we concocted this idea to come up with an exhibit in an art gallery, and we called it Dent City, and it was about issues of housing homelessness, but we made it like an art show. And we took 12 of our projects, and then we researched each one, each one the density of the building, and then the density of the surrounding neighborhood, because people, the layperson does not understand what density means and what it looks like um, at all. There's di difference between population density and home density, and it's up to our profession to actually explain ourselves to people and to get people on board with these better concepts and ideas. There were hundreds of people there because they were not threatened by us talking about density and explaining some educational, you know, what it is. We just said it's an art exhibit. Everybody came and was looking and reading, and they asked me to be on the Santa Monica Television Channel. I was asked to be on the Planning Commission and Joint Housing Department Planning Commission meeting about density. It was a bit ironic we were getting, if you know, hypoallergenic. It's a mainstream art magazine that they were showing our affordable housing exhibit as a must-see exhibit. You know, so I think it's mainly about how do you change the dialogue. How do you tell the story? How do you tell the story? There's no reason to be threatened by the housing. If it's done right, it basically makes our communities better. So we're going to leave you with this little short clip that uh, has won a bunch of awards that talks about affordable housing. We've become a culture that ignores people and looks the other way. Our homeless problem, especially in Los Angeles, is so large now that it's almost untenable. Los Angeles has the highest number of unsheltered people anywhere in the country, and clearly you can see that in Skid Row. 
There's a lot of suffering that goes on. If you're not ready to live in the streets, it gets pretty profound. For those individuals who have been largely isolated and alone, beginning to try to build a sense of homelessness can look like. I've known Mike for a long time, and this is really our first um, collaboration. The name of this project is The Six that we did for Mike, and that means that, in military terms, it means I've got your back. And really, Mike is the six for homeless people. I think I was one of the first people who moved, who had keys, and I thought I, I, thought I was dreaming. And I came in and looked, it was empty. I was like, whose house is this? They said, yours. I got a little radio, a microwave, a crock pot. What more can you ask for? They have everything contained in their own unit, but then we have my breath away. Because I've been suffering for a number of years. Suffering for years. And uh, what are you gonna expect, you know? Breaking stereotypes of the homeless goes back to design. It says something. It says we care about you. Design definitely can empower an individual. If you ask Mike, he'll tell you that good design is part of the healing. A little bit like Frank Sinatra. If you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. No one has a bigger homeless crisis than we do here in Skid Row. I think it's absolutely a replicable model. All you need is the will to do it. These are our cities. Whatever we make here, Whatever buildings we build here, they're part of the larger fabric that defines our cities. Thank you, everyone. Good. Yep. We'll be here for another hour. <laughs> <laughs>